So, uh, if you recall, in the previous class, towards the end, we started looking at information about next to information, and then we were trying to minimize the number of entries. Yeah. Now, actually, if you look at this part, this was just to bring this example out, but actually, we don't minimize the number of entries. What we do is we use next to information to, at the time of code generation, to make sure that when I am using registers, when I am using temporaries, I use fewer temporaries. So when I talk about four generations, that time you will see that I am actually going to use the next use information. So let's look at what code generator does. And what I'm assuming here is that we have created this code, we already have a model of the machine in mind. And this three at this code is now to be converted and we look at both arithmetic, logical, boolean or kind of expressions into some kind of machine syntax. That is the intention. So what we want to do now is that for each statement, okay, and each statement is in general of the form, either x being assigned by of z, or is uh, if x rel of y then go to some label is of this form. What we want to do is we want to remember if operand is in the register. And by register, register is one of the resources. But we'll also remember more things. So what we do is we create two kind of descriptors now. One is what we call as register descriptor. So basically what I do is I create a table. And in this table I say that if I have registers R0 to Rn minus 1, I want to remember what each of these registers contain. Okay? So I may have information by saying that this register contains value of A, this register contains value of B, this register may contain C and so on. Okay? I may also have a situation where I may say that a register may contain two variables. So a register may contain, let's say, A and B. How would that happen? Is that possible that a register simultaneously can contain value of two variables? Possible? So I don't look at the value. I don't know I mean, how many variables may have the same value. So the reason this may happen is that suppose I say A is assigned, D is assigned A. So what I do, I may do is that I have a temporary which has been loaded in a register. Then I just do an assignment. Okay? Now assignment means this value is already in the register. I don't have to change anything in my description. Okay? So register descriptor basically says keep track of what is currently in each of the registers and initially before the basic block, I assume that every register is just empty. Okay, so I start using registers as I enter my basic block. Now I have another descriptor, and this is called address descriptor. And what I do here is that for each of the variables, I want to now keep information, and these variables are nothing but either they could be user variables or which are in the simple table, or they could be temporary variables. Okay? And I want to keep information like that for each variable. So if these are my variables, I want to know places where they are available. So this may be available, for example, in both register and memory. Okay. Now a variable may also be available simultaneously at more than one place. So for example, if I say that I have a variable in memory and then I say load it in register, so then it immediately becomes available at two places. Okay. So this is what my address descriptor is. That I want to keep track of locations where current value of the name can be found at runtime. Okay, because we are not talking about execution of the program. Okay? And the location might be a register, stack, memory address, or a set of these locations. So <coughs> a variable may be available simultaneously in more than one location, and a register may keep value of many variables, including simultaneously more than one variable. So these are the two descriptors I create when I start doing code generation that I say that initially, now initially, where will variable be? What will this register descriptor contain? And I start doing code generation of a basic block. All of them will be in some memory location. They are not going to be in any of the registers. I will start loading them as I go through registers. And each register to begin with is going to have, is going to be in right. So these are the two descriptors I have. When I come to booleans, I will add more information. Okay. But right now for arithmetic and logical expressions, uh, there is sufficient information as well as code generation. Okay. So what we do now is, let's look at how we do code generation. And what I'm looking at is the simplest possible opcode. In fact, I mean, this is 
the most general output, which is x being assigned y of z. Okay. The I can have unary operators, so I can say x is assigned of y, or I can have just assignment where I say x is assigned y, okay. but those are actually simpler cases. This is the most complex case I have. Okay. Well, first, conceptually understand what I am trying to do here. <coughs> we want to generate fast, efficient code, and therefore, as far as possible, we would like to use registers. Okay. Now, suppose I say that I want to compute these values. Now, to begin with, everything is in memory, and y and z are in memory, and I want to apply this operation on them and store value in x. Okay. Now, as far as possible, I would like to use a register to store value of x. That's the first thing. Second thing I'll say is that suppose y is or z is already in one of the registers, and that register has or that particular variable has no feature use, then I can reuse the same register. And this information comes from the next use information. Okay. So, what I do is that first I say, let me get a register for doing this operation. That's the first function I call. As far as possible, we will try to use register. If register is not available or register is not required, then I will use a memory location. But my first preference is always going to be a register. So, first I do is I make a call to a function which I call get register, okay, and we will look at this function in the next coil. But what this function does, it actually returns a location which says this is where you can compute and store value of x. Okay. So, what this get register does, we invoke a function called get register which determines some location. So, this location need not be a register, it could be anything, but so do not confuse between this name get register and location L, get register always need not return a register to okay. it could be any location, but preferably it will be a register where x is going to be stored and usually L is going to be a register, that is always my perspective. Okay. Now, if this is in a register, what do I do? I will say that I can load, now suppose this register did not contain anything, what I can do is I can load y into the register and then I can apply that operation on the register with z and I am done okay? and then I just have to move it. Okay? But suppose now if I check that y is already in that register, I can do that check and how do I check that? So, it is possible that get register found that since y does not have a feature use, I can return whatever register is being used for y for keeping the value of x. So, remember this p1 is being assigned p1 plus p. Okay? So, I know that beyond this point P1 has no use, so I can use the same register. So, I need to check whether this register contains already Y or not. Okay? So, now we look at address descriptor of Y and we want to find out Y prime. Now, remember what is Y prime? Y may be simultaneously available in more than one location. I want one of those locations which is the fastest to access and fastest is normally going to be a register. So, we determine Y prime and we prefer a register for Y prime and if value of Y is already not in L, then what do I do? I generate one instruction which says move y prime to L. Okay? Now, remember what may happen here is that I am saying that look at y, I look at address descriptor which says that y is in register R0, but R0 may have a future use. So, get register did not return that. It returned register R2 for example. Okay? Now, I cannot overwrite R0. I need to protect it. So, what do I do? I say that now move copy value from R0 to say R2. Okay? And then, once I have generated this instruction, so move instruction is basically a copy which says that from the location where y is stored and that value location is y prime, load this value into l. That is the location which has been returned to me. And after that, I generate one more operation which says now op and op is this op which is this operation op z prime l. Okay. Now, what is this? What is z prime? Z prime again is a location from where I can pick up value of z at one time and this again is expected to be the fastest location which I can use. So, it is possible that z also from the address descriptor is available in multiple locations and if it is already in a register, then what do I do? I just apply this operation on this. So, suppose to begin with I say y is in r0, z is in r1 and this returns a value saying that both r0 and r1 have a future use. I cannot feed, it returns R3 for this. So, what do I do? Immediately I say first move Y to R3 and then I say add R2 to R3. Okay. So, these are the two instructions it is going to generate and sometimes first instruction may not be generated if Y is already in a register which has been returned for computation of X. Then I generate only the second instruction. Right? Now, what do I do after this?
So I started doing code generation for this three address code, which says x is y of z, and I have generated these two instructions. Am I done? Do I need to do anything more? Any more code generation or any more bookkeeping? I need to do bookkeeping now because now I'll have to change all my descriptors. So now I'll say that I'm using now L, which may be a register. So now this contains value of x. And then I have to change address descriptors of x to say that x is now available in this particular location. So now, again, I'm going to prefer a register for z, which was z prime. And after this, I update all my descriptors of x to indicate that x is in L. And if L is a register, update its descriptor to say that now it contains x and remove x from all other locations. Okay. So I do bookkeeping after doing this code generation. And now we say that if y and z, they have no next use. And this is where this next use information is coming in. And we say that they are dead, going to be, they are going to be dead on exit from this block. Okay. We change descriptors to indicate that they are no longer containing these registers. So that get register can take advantage of this fact that this is no longer available as a register and therefore these registers immediately become free. Okay. So I need to generate two instructions and I, then I need to do some bookkeeping. Okay. This is where I use next to the this is one of the places where I do it. Okay. Simple, straightforward. Okay. So as far as simple arithmetic instructions are concerned, I can easily take a free address instruction and I can map it onto a machine. Now you can see that I assumed a machine which has move and so on. Now you can see that if I am using certain addressing modes, then I will have to use addressing modes for y prime and z prime. Okay. At least I am assuming it is a register. So that, that will be straightforward. So if I have complex addressing modes, then I will say that whatever that addressing mode is, which will help me in fetching value of y prime and value of z prime, I'm going to use that addressing mode, which I am not putting explicitly. Clear? Yeah? Okay. Now let's move on to this function get rel, which I used here. Okay. Now how will get rel work? Okay. So get rel is saying that get rel is being invoked to say that give me a location where I can do this computation. So what do I do? Now we say that if y is in some register. So what is y now? y is the first operand here. Okay. So now we say that if y is in some register, that does not hold any other value. You can see that y may have some other value where this variable may not have a future use, but this may have. So still I cannot feed that register. Okay. So I need to remember that. So if y is in some register and has no other value <coughs> and y is not live and has no next use after this particular location, then what can I do? I can say use the same register. Okay, so if we say y is in register r0 and beyond this r0 does not hold any other variable and y has no next use, that means I can free r0 immediately after this particular instruction. I use the same register for doing this computation and get rel is just going to return a register for it. Now it may so happen that this register either holds additional value or y may not be in a register. Okay. In that case, this condition is going to fail. So what do I do? In that case, I say get, get a free register okay, and use that okay, in that case. Like I was giving you the previous example, I just took a fresh register. So to begin with, no variable will be in register. So first time I am going to use a new register. Okay. Now suppose there is no empty register. This can still fail, right? That I find all the registers are full. Then what do I do? I can find the memory location, but I prefer a register. All registers are occupied. So can I free a register temporarily? So this is what is known as register spilling. I can say this register does not have an immediate use. What I can do is I can take value of this register, load it into some temporary location, start using this register, and when that particular variable is required, then I load it back into the register and continue from that point onwards. And this is a technique which is known as register spilling. So what we do is, if x has an excuse in the block or operation is such that it requires a register, then get a register and how do I get a register? Store its content into memory location by this and use it. Okay? And at some point of time, we have to get it. Well, advantage of this is going to be that suppose this x has a lot of uses beyond this one. Okay. And this particular variable which is contained in R is not going to be used in say next two instructions. Then I may do only one extra 
store and extra load, but then all the access accesses of variable x are going to be very fast. That's the advantage. So now you can see that if x has an excuse in block, or this operation sometimes may say that I can do this operation only on a register. I cannot do this operation on a memory location. <coughs> then I need a register. So register spilling is a standard technique which is used, and as far as and you can see that register spilling is always going to have an overhead. So you would like to minimize register spilling as far as possible. And we'll see example of how to reduce register spilling. But in this case, we have to do a register spilling. Okay. Now suppose this is not required that either we say that this is the only time I'm computing x beyond this point, x is not going to have a use, and therefore there's no point doing a spilling. That means moving <coughs> something into a memory location and loading it back. And also the operation is such that it does not require a register. Okay. Then I may use directly memory location for X and store the value there. Okay. So only this memory location will be used if all these conditions fit. So as far as possible, use a register. But if there is no free register, then try to use a register by freeing it temporarily and using it. But if it is not required, then there is no need to free a register because every freeing a register requires two operations. One for moving the content back into memory, and second time moving it back into the register. Okay. So then you will save these two instructions. So this is what get registered. Okay. Now there are a lot of optimizations you can see immediately possible here because I say here if x is in a register that holds no other value, I can do the same thing for z. Okay. And also you will see that I mean, and this is something you can try by compiling your program for C and you will find that lot of actually optimization which goes on here and it is not possible that if I look at this, it is non-trivial to find out whether x plus equal y and x is being assigned x plus y, okay, they are equivalent. Okay. Uh, it is not easy for compiler to do this kind of symbolic computation. So many times you will find that when it comes to code generation, compilers generate better code for this as compared to this. Okay? Because then they assume that the first operand on the right hand side is same as the left hand side and therefore you are saying that whatever is the variable here that is being used to store the value of the left hand side. Okay? So normally I mean why I mean C introduced these kind of operators, the reason was that I do not have to do too much of symbolic computation, I do not have to do optimization at that level. If operator, if end user can help me in using these kind of operators then all this Okay. In fact, it becomes sometimes worse than this that suppose I have a long right hand side okay, where x occurs somewhere, okay, then whether in general this can be transformed into something like this, okay, it is not real. Okay. Computationally, it becomes very possible. Okay. You can do a lot of symbolic analysis and you can do all this reorganization, but that unnecessarily takes time, and therefore, if user knows that this is much faster than okay. you will find that. So, you will find that lot of C code when you read okay, is written in this style okay. and there is a purpose for introducing these operators that I can generate more efficient code. Clear how we generate code now for arithmetic operators? So, this can take care of all possible arithmetic operators. It can even take care of Boolean operators if I am just doing assignment. So, we will see how the conditionals are handled, but at least as far as assignment of Boolean operations etc. is concerned, you can see that I am just using op here, I have not specified what kind of operation is this. So, any binary operator, unary operator, any single assignment okay, is going to work for everything. Okay. So, how do we handle, okay, so I have an example, good. So, let us go through this example. Okay. So, what we have is, suppose I am trying to, so I am looking at a block in which the first instruction says P1 is assigned A minus minus. Okay, and the notation is saying that whenever I use this T1, T2 and so on, these are temporary variables generated by compiler and whenever I use other letters like A, B, C, B, etc., they are the user variables. Okay. And we will assume that all user variables are going to be live on exit from the basic law. Okay. So, what we do here is, we for this we say that my get register routine, because nothing is in register, returns a register which says it can be used for computation which is R0. So, I now first say move a to R0 and then I subtract B from R0. And how do my descriptors change? At end of this, these two instructions, this says R0 now contains T1 and this address descriptor says that T1 is in R0. Okay. And then I have this instruction, it says T2 is assigned 
a minus c okay now what do i do now i can see that a is now what happened here was that i decided that whatever is this value okay i am going through another load again here okay so now since this value is already in t1 we now say that move a to r1 and then we say that and the reason will become apparent when we look at the rest of the code okay why i am doing this extra work and then i say subtract c from r1 okay so now at end of this we say that r0 contains t1 and r1 contains t2 and t1 is in r0 and t2 is in r1 okay so let me actually give you the full code here okay okay so now it says t3 is assigned t1 plus t2 so now i find that both t1 and t2 are in registers okay so and beyond this point t1 has no use so this register can be used and therefore what we do is we straight away instead of doing a move operation straight away do an addition and my descriptors change like this and then i say add t3 and t2 and t2 is in r1 so now i can use because beyond this point you will find that neither of r0 or r1 is going to have a use so what i do is i just do this addition and then store it into memory location d and my descriptors now say that r0 contains d and d is in r0 and d is both in r0 and memory location because of this move operation okay so this way my code generation can happen okay but when it comes to conditional i have to deal slightly differently okay? and machines provide special hardware to deal with conditions okay so what happens here is that normally uh, if you recall assembly language programming you have done you will find that there is something called the conditional port descriptor okay or condition port bits on the machine so whenever you execute an instruction on a machine simultaneously depending upon the value of the result some bits are going to be set so suppose the value is very high some overflow bit will be set or value is too low underflow bit may be set if value is zero some zero bit may be set if value is negative some positive bit may be set if uh, some negative bit may be set if value is positive then some positive bit may be set and so on. okay and that happens automatically in the hardware and advantage of doing that is that when it comes to conditionals i can take care of many of the jumps by looking at these condition code bits i don't have to explicitly do the computations so what may happen is something like this that when i say i have branches so what may happen is something like this i say that if x is less than y then go to z okay now i for example if i look at first two instructions here this says move x into r0 and then it says subtract y from r0 now i don't have to know the value of r0 i don't have to compare value of r0 with whether it is less than 0 or not okay simultaneously what will happen is that some condition code bit will be set which will say that if r0 is negative then that bit is set and what do i do here then i just say that jump if that bit is negative on the location z okay so basically what we do is that if one of these six conditions so it could be either negative 0 or positive or non negative non zero and non positive and many machines will have up to 16 condition code bits and simultaneously on each operation more than one condition code bits may get affected okay you're going to set that bit and then we use this information here in the instruction and do this so i you can see that i am not comparing r0 with anything but this condition code information is being used because condition code has been set because of this operation okay so what we are doing now is that we use condition codes and we indicate what was the last quantity which was computed and load even when i do a move for example so for example when i say move x into r0 some condition code bit will be set okay depending upon what is the value i am moving what is the value of x okay so if value of x is positive then automatically move x r0 will set the condition code okay. so this is loaded into location okay and depending upon what was the computation or loading which happened one of these bits is going to set and i am just using this extra information but machines also provide the compare instruction where i don't even have to do a move and don't have to do as arithmetic or logical operation i can state i will do comparison operation and comparison operation also is going to set one of the condition code bits so what may happen is something like this when i say compare x and y this sets some condition code bit to positive if x is greater than y okay and similarly for other value so what i may do is if i say if i want to do code generation for this i may just say compare x and y and condition on less to z 
okay so this becomes now a conditional jump okay so this is so there are two kind of jumps one is unconditional jump where i just don't test anything i say straight away change the program counter to this new value so jump is nothing but changing the value of pc okay and a condition conditional jump is you say that change the program counter to z only if this condition is met it says that it is less okay so i can use both these okay but then i can also use to remember something known as conditional descriptor so i have these two descriptors now i can also keep one more descriptor and say that what was the last operation which saved a bit or which impacted a bit okay so what may happen here is something very interesting okay so look at this if i can remember suppose i say x is sin y plus z and then i say if x is less than 0 then jump okay now because of this computation i don't even have to have a comparison operation what i can do is if i can remember what i can do is i generate three instructions for x being assigned by or z so i say move y into r0 at z and then i say move r0 to x okay now when this happens then i know that one of the condition code bits is going to be set because of x now it is possible that these two instructions are not adjacent there is may there be maybe there are few other instructions which are in between but they are not impacting the value of x okay i can still use if i can remember that the last time i loaded x this bit since that has not changed it was set by x okay so what can happen in that case is i can now just say that jump on negative to <coughs> some little help so this operation itself you can see that i can even say one comparison instruction if i can remember this particular thing that the last operation was the one which really changed this particular bit okay but for that i need to do additional bookkeeping and that additional bookkeeping is in terms of a condition code descriptor so for each of these condition code bits i can say that which bit was set because of what operation if i can remember that then i can for the save certain instructions okay but i mean again you have to see that whether machine provides this information and machine provides all these facilities or not okay so some of the earlier machines for example did not have enough condition code bits they did the i think the uh, earliest i remember is uh, a one byte condition code uh, register or condition code bits that means i could set on the eight conditions and some of the recent machines had 16 conditions and 32 conditions and so on so all kind of funny things will happen but if you can remember those things then you can impact this clear okay so you can see that how do i handle conditionals and how do i handle other pre address codes okay and this as far as machine is concerned is really nothing but correct code which is coming out you have a question in the last case if the more than one comparison in the last place if you have uh, like here if x less than 0 go to the final comparison instruction in code so it does not involve it. which does not it does not involve x it involves some other variable hmm. then the like this only saves the uh, the last variable that to so my conditional descriptor will say that uh, but it does uh, then that that will be overwritten what that will be overwritten but then see this descriptor here condition code descriptor so my condition code descriptor suppose i say that x is sin y plus z and then i say compare say a and b suppose i have one more study compare a b. okay now compare a b is going to impact certain bit now as soon as it impacts a bit my conditional this condition code descriptor is going to say which bit was impacted and if it was the same bit which was impacted by x then my descriptor will change and i will not be able to generate this instruction but suppose that bit was not impacted which was set by x then i can use so that's why i'm saying i need to do additional bookkeeping here <coughs> it is not on the hardware but the compiler is to do instead of saving only one bit we can have a bit map a bit map so we can then we will be able to save uh, yeah many variables that change that it's not in the my control right that is the hardware see this descriptor condition code descriptor is in the my control So I can say if I have 16 bits, I'll say that I'll keep this condition code descriptor and say that for each bit, okay. So this is bit one, bit two, and so on, okay. I'll remember that what impacted it. But how is bit one set and bit two is set and bit three is set? That is not under my control. That is under control of hardware. 
hardware has already decided that if this instruction executes, okay, these, 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 and these conditions are met, then these, these, these bits are going to be cleared or set. That's beyond us. So the descriptor I can keep is only for all the bits and for the instructions which are impacting those bits. Right? Is the question answered or not? Okay. So let's move on. Okay. And let's also see that how do I generate code for that? Okay. Now so far, okay, uh, I've been looking at three address code, but we also remember that at one point of time we started looking at DAGs. And how is a DAG different from three address code? Uh, how is a tree different from an expression tree different from a tree address code? Only name of temporaries are not the same, right? Okay. So in a tree or DAG, I will not have temporaries. I will have only internal loads. And when I explicitly write tree address code, I am going to have these temporary names. Okay. So basically, what will happen is that when I start doing code generation for a tree or DAG, I'll have to remember now that what is the name I am using internally for each of the nodes. That's the only additional thing I need to do now. Okay, because these names have to be generated at some point of time. Okay. So what will happen is that this is useful data structure. So we have already talked about properties of these DAGs. But basically, leaves are going to be labeled by the identifiers, which are either variable or the constants. Interior nodes are going to be labeled by an operator symbol. And nodes are also optionally given now a sequence of identifiers or labels. Because I will have to jump somewhere. So I need to have labels. And this is the only information I will have as far as a tree or diary is concerned. Other names I will have to temporarily get. Okay. So let's look at this particular piece of code. Okay. So this is some DAG, uh, some representation of a DAG where I am saying that I want to compute T1 which is 4 star i, T2 which is array axis with this particular axis of A. So this is basically saying is AI. Then I recompute T4 star i and then I say T4 is sign. BT3. So this is fetching AI. This is fetching. Uh, this is fetching AI. This is giving you BI. Then I am adding the two. And what is this doing? Then I am saying that I am after doing this multiplication, I am adding it to a variable product. This product is then assigned T6. I increment I, and then I I is assigned T7, right? And then I check whether this is less than equal to 20. And if it is, then I jump to label one. So what is this is doing? Is just taking two arrays and finding out their dot product. Right. This is the computation I am doing. Now you can see that here 4 star i is being decomputed. <coughs> now since I am talking about that, you can see that I will not recompute, but I will use the same nodes for this computation. And similarly, when I say t1, t1 is 4 star i and therefore t3 also is 4 star i. So if I just compute this t1, I can access a with t1 and I can access b with t1. Okay. And as far as these two instructions are concerned, which says t6 is assigned prod plus t5 and then prod is assigned t6. Since there is a single assignment, I could have said right away t6 is being assigned t6 or prod is being assigned prod plus t5 and here I can straight away say i is being assigned i plus 1. Right? This is how it so happened that this is how I generated my code. Okay? Okay. So we look at i0 which is basically i and this is 4. The two are multiplied value is stored in t1. So this t1 actually now contains star 4 i. Okay? And then I have a and t2 is basically saying that I am looking at base address of a and I am looking at index t1 and t2 is now an array operation which is saying a t1. So this is corresponding to the second instruction. And then I say since t3 is a copy of t1, therefore instead of generating a new tree, I just generate a label internally for t3 and say that t3 is now, capturing the computation which is below this node, and then I have T4 being signed BT3. Now, T3 is same as this. So, uh, what happens here? Yeah. So, we have B here, and T4 is nothing but B and the same node, which could either be called now T1 or T3. It okay, doesn't matter. Okay. And the next one is T5 is signed T2 multiplied by T4. So, T2 multiplied by T4 is being assigned t5 okay these are the two edges which are not visible and then we say t6 is assigned prod plus uh, prod multiplied uh, prod plus t5 so i am looking at t5 and i am looking at prod i am adding the two and that goes into t6 and then i say prod is nothing but t6 so therefore this node is also given a label called prod okay 
and then I say T7 is assigned I plus 1. So, T7 will now take this value. So, this is taking I plus 1 which is going into T7 and then I say I is assigned T7. So, I now gets the same label and now I have this conditional which says if I is less than equal to 20 then I go to 1. So, what I do here is I have this conditional which is testing for less than equal and is jumping on label 1 and it is testing this value with 20. This is the okay. So, this is how the DAG looks okay. and then if I look at the code generation, okay, this is the straight code for the tree not really the DAG. Okay. So, what happens here? Now, here we are saying that S1, S1 is now some symbolic resource which is being assigned for star i, I look at the base address of A and then I do this array and I do this computation, but if I do it for the DAG, what are the instructions I will say? Immediately you can see that this instruction will be eliminated and instead of S4 here, I will use S1, but what happens to this part? Okay. This part I will say that prod is generated, so S8 will be eliminated because this is just a copy and I will say prod is assigned prod plus S7 and similarly this part will say that I is assigned I plus 1 and this is the conditional, so I will be able to eliminate one of the instructions here. Okay. So, this is how the whole code looks okay. that this instruction gets eliminated and this instruction these two are merged in one, these two are merged in one. Okay. So, this is the advantage of that. Okay, and you can see that basically how do I do code generation and we shortly see how to do code generation for trees. Okay, if I know it for how to do it for tree then you can see that I can do it for DAG also because the way we treat it DAGs okay, we are keeping extra labels for this. Okay. So, we have seen how to do code generation for three address code, but we have not seen how to do code generation for trees as yet, but basically since we are going to do that next, okay, I am showing you that basically you can handle the two things together. Okay, so, we will see how to do code generation for these. Okay. All right. So, let us move on. Okay. Now, let us come to <coughs> something I just mentioned about register speed. Okay. And if you recall in the beginning, I said one of the optimizations was that I wanted to change the order of execution. So, now when I say that A is assigned B plus C, and suppose B and C are expressions then which expression should be evaluated first? Suppose both are function calls. So, suppose I write a code like this. Here I say that T is assigned let us say F1 plus F2 and both are function calls. Okay. This clearly says do a evaluation from left to right, but what is normally not specified is many times which function should be evaluated first. Okay. And suppose these are complex expressions. Okay. So, bot mass rule tells me that yes, I have to evaluate it from left to right, okay. but most of the time we do not really unless they are explicit side effects and I am doing partial evaluation and side effects could be different. Okay. I do not care about how do I do my evaluation whether it is left or right. Most compilers will try to do it in an order so that I can optimize my resources. Okay. Now, how does changing the order of evaluation optimize my resources? So, look at a simple situation. Suppose I have some limited resources, I have n resources. Okay. Now, when I start doing this computation, this could be an arbitrary complex expression. I start doing this computation, suppose efficient computation of this requires n registers and I have only n registers. Okay. What will happen here that I am going to use all the n registers for this computation, but finally I will leave this value either in a register or if I require more registers then I will do a spilling okay. and I will leave this code store this particular value in memory location. Now, suppose I leave it in a register, then I am left with one, <coughs> one fewer register. Okay. Now, suppose this also required n registers. Okay. Then, this register can come only because of scaling. Okay. So, what may happen is that if I change my order of execution, so look at this code. Okay. Now, this code actually is interesting. What I have is T1 is being assigned A plus B then T2 is being assigned C plus D and T3 is being assigned E minus T2. So, you can see that this particular instruction depends on this, but if you look at T1, T1 is being used only in the fourth instruction. Okay. Now, if I look at the tree corresponding to this, again I mean these edges are not visible, sorry about this, but uh, what is happening here is that I am on the left hand side, I am saying that A and B are being computed and they are being stored in T1 
and then on the right hand side E and D are being computed, they are, uh, C and D are being added that is being stored in T2 and then I am saying E minus T2 is being computed and that is being stored in T3 and then I say X is now being computed by saying T3 minus uh, T1 minus T3. Okay? This is the kind of situation I have. Okay? Now suppose that I have only, I have 3 address code okay? and I have only 2 registers available. That is an assumption I am making and I am doing my left to right evaluation. So, what may happen is that I will generate this kind of code. So, this says this corresponding to saying that I am moving A into a register then I am adding B to this. So, this gives me now A plus B. Okay? And then I say I move C into a register. So, A plus B is now available in register R0. Okay? So, one register is now blocked from the left hand side. Now, I say move C to R1 and then I say add now D to R1. So, I am now computing C plus D and beyond this now I say move R0 to T1. Okay? Now, why I am doing this? Basically, now I want to do this computation which says that I temporarily free this register R0. Okay? This basically is now doing a register spilling and then I am moving into, into a register which has been freed by this particular spilling and then I do this subtraction and after I have this done this subtraction and one of the registers has become free, then I move T1 back into R1 and then I subtract R0 from R1. So, basically after this, this R1 is being stored in X and now if I change order of execution here, suppose I say that I am first doing this computation. Now, you can see that this is a larger expression which requires extra registers. Okay? This is a smaller expression, it requires one less register. Okay? Suppose I did this computation first, okay? then these two instructions I am generating which is moving R0 to T1 and moving T1 into R1 these two instructions would have been saved because this is basically is the register scale. Okay? So, what kind of code I will generate? Okay? This is now going to give me faster code because these two instructions are saved and basically this is saying now compute C plus D E minus C plus D which is being computed and that is being stored in R1 and then I am left with R0 and I can use R0 for doing this computation which says T1 is assigned a plus B. So, A plus B is now computed in R0 and then I do this subtraction. Okay? So, basically this is what is register spilling and this is what register reloading is. So, sometimes changing the order of execution is going to give you faster code. So, normally there is one technique which is used is that when I am trying to do code generation for trees, I use dynamic program and I say that I keep on commute, computing the cost of so, cost could be in terms of number of registers and say that I keep on computing number of resources required for the left hand side and the right hand side and I determine which is the optimal way of doing it. Okay? But dynamic programming immediately makes it cost here. Okay? Your complexity, computational complexity goes up. Okay? So, you can either do it in single traversal and incur this cost, but many times when you want to get it optimized code, okay, then you use dynamic programming for doing that and find out that using computing this part into a register and then doing this computation is faster okay? and you have not violated any rule because there are no side effects the computation is going to remain the same and therefore, you can get much faster code as compared to this one. Okay? Now, you can see that actually I mean so this is another thing I mean that has to sort of register in your mind okay? and I should come clearly when we take a faster code. Okay? Now, you may start computing oh, how much I am saving, I am only saving 2 instructions, no big deal. Okay? But what you have to remember is that if I count number of instructions, I have how many? 4 and 2, 6 and 2, 8 plus 2, 10 instructions. And when I say I am saving 2, I am saving 2 out of 10, which is 20 percent saving. And if this is part of a loop, which is executing large number of times, then this 20 percent saving can be very large. Okay? In fact, when people are doing optimization, Nobody is saying whether my program can run 100 percent faster or can double the speed or triple the speed. No. I mean people are saying can I have a program run 10 percent faster, 20 percent faster, can I cut down my execution time by say 10 percent. Okay. That is a big game for people. I mean imagine a situation where somebody's program is running for 20 hours. Okay. If you say I can finish this in 16 hours, that is a big game for the person. Okay. And all large computational programs actually run in those days. I mean, in terms of hours and days. Okay. They are not like I mean you type the program say a dot out press return and result is there. Okay. You press a dot out and then you go home submit it in that and come back after 3 days and check your result. Okay. 
Normally, this is what happens, and that is where all these optimizations come. So even a small saving there, 5%, 10% saving, is matters a lot. Okay? And that, that's the number of people are looking at. Nobody is looking at, can I double the speed of my program? I mean, that is something, unless you have very special hardware, is utopian. On a single machine, no matter of optimization, and a single processor is going to give you that kind of speed. Okay? Unless you have some very specific program which will do this. Yes? So rearranging order is important. Okay? But this is not the only thing we want to do. We want to do more optimization. And this more optimization is what we know as people optimization. Okay, so I'll just introduce this and then uh, we can take a break. So basically, what people optimization is something like this. I look at three address code. Okay? So let me go back to uh, an example we had yesterday. Um, let me look at this code. First example ah, here. Okay? So what we want to do is I say that here are six instructions I have. Okay? Let me have a small window, which I call a people, okay? and move it over this code. Okay? And when I say move it over this code, I say that, suppose my people is of size 2. Okay? Then you say that, okay, move it over this code and say, look at these two consecutive instructions and say that, can I convert this into a faster instruction? Okay? Now, when you move it over this part of the code, okay, you will see that immediately it will notice that you are saying move R0 into a register and then you are saying move R into a moving A into a register and doing a load and store. So people have created these kind of pamphlets now where you say I am doing this kind of store and then I am loading this value, second instruction can always be erased. Okay. Similarly, if I say that my window is of size 3, okay, then I can experiment with this code and say oh I know this template, this is just adding a constant value to the register and I can then just replace this by single instruction. Okay? So people optimization in general is a technique where I examine my code after code generation has happened. I don't do any, this, any of these optimization prior to code generation. And once I have this code, then I define my people of size 2, 3, 4 and normally people have experimented and normally it was found, these are empirical results, don't ask for any proof because there is none. This says that normally if I have a people of size 4 to 5, then a large number of optimizations can be done by just mapping these templates. <coughs> okay. So what you try to do is you create a lot of templates and then move it over the code and whenever you find a template like this, then just replace it by a faster instruction sequence. So it is possible that I may take these two instructions, replace this by one, I may take these three instructions, replace it by two and so on. Okay. And do it few times and you improve quality of your code. Okay. So what we will do in the next class is we will look at few templates of people optimization and then we will also look at code generation for how to do code generation for trees like we did for three and this code. Okay. So this is where we we'll take a break today and uh, last class in the last class we will discuss these things. Okay, on Thursday.